So everyone always says they want me to look younger because it is retro ups and downs. Fine, this is kind of what I looked like in 2002. Oh, how I miss it. But anyway, the big talking point from the 2002 Royal Rumble were two separate names, none other than Kevin Nash and Scottus Hall. Because they had been teased massively on the Raw after the pay-per-view, because of course Vincent Mann had lost to Ric Flair and was all like, oh, I'm gonna do something that we all regret. Like when you want to eat a wheel of cheese. Now behind the scenes, the conversation had been going on for ages with the big sticking point being what big Kevin Nash wanted. But eventually, I guess, WWE was worried about business. They gave him all the money. They gave him a reduced schedule. Although when it came to Scott Hall, he got a little bit less because everyone was just a bit worried when it came to his personal problems. I mean, go and read about WCW. Obviously, this led to folk assuming that Hulk Hogan was going to come back too, and they were correct. And then, of course, on the following SmackDown, I should have put on this chair and I didn't, but we had that segment when McMahon spun around his sitting device, and on the back, it said NWO, and he said it all with a croaky voice. Remember that? It was like, I'm going to kill my own creation, the NWO. So what the flub is wrong with you? I can't criticize it, though, because I remember I absolutely lost my mind when he did this. And I started counting through the days, going, when are they going to come? When are they going to come? Oh, my gosh, when are they going to come? Like Veer on Raw. There's already a ton of news out there as well, because x Pack and Shawn Michaels are eventually going to join, but we were going to keep Triple H out of it. And of course, anyone backstage was a bit like, we're bringing those guys in. I remember what they had been doing in the other place. They better not do it here. But as for the Rumble itself, it actually is pretty good. The only real shame being that both now and all the way back in 2002, it was so obvious that the game Hunter Hearst Helmsley was going to win. He had had that amazing comeback at Madison Square Garden like three weeks prior. So who else was it going to be? Also, it was a record at the time. It goes one hour and nine minutes. You do get an absolute joyful moment, though, because, of course, Kurt Henning, Mr. Perfect, is in this. And while it's not a mega surprise because he already returned to the company, this hair is getting in my eye, he is treated like a mega deal and even goes toe-to-toe with Triple H and Steve Austin. Made me feel good. And if you are wondering, well, why did Mr. Perfect return here and not months prior, given that WCW had died ages ago, it's because there was a brand new promotion called the XWF. They had gone, Hennig, would you like to be the world champion? And then amazingly, the phone just rang and it was WWE. It's such a shame that he did get caught up in that plane ride from hell, though, which meant he was released a few months after this. And if you jump forward to February 2003, he passed away. That is way, way too young, because I tell you, even in his fleeting appearance here, he is one of the best. Just to be a little bit cheesy, damn perfect. Elsewhere too, New Japan was melting down because their three top stars are gone, <laughs> we don't want to be here anymore, we're going to jump to all Japan. And Ken Shamrock was making all the money when he got off in a ton of cash to fight on Fry. Which is probably why he didn't return to wrestling in the early 2000s, because people were keeping him financially happy. And that is kind of sad. Ken deserved another run. Still, it is time to go back to the 20th of January 2002 in Atlanta, Georgia, in front of over 16,000 people and a whopping 670,000 on pay-per-view. Goes to show, Attitude Era wasn't completely dead, but let's up those downs for the 2002 Royal Rumble. Now the intro video, still got that in my head, for the 2002 Royal Rumble absolutely rules, because you get this spingly spangly music when in the distance you could hear the voices of Howard Finkel and Gorilla Monsoon. And you know, they're absolutely legendary, brought a tear to my eye. So WWE really does get it when they want to get it. <laughs> the Undertaker takes over and goes, I'm going to be the only dog in that yard when I get in that ring. Damn it, Mark, what have you done? They also get an absolutely stupid start too, because it is Taz and Spike Dudley defending their tag team titles against the Dudley boys, who are accompanied by Stacey Keebler. The reason I say stupid too is because this goes a whopping <laughs> five minutes. Yep. Spike is also wearing a neck collar because he had been absolutely destroyed on SmackDown by the Dudleys and everybody is fine with this. Now don't forget, if you wear this around your neck, it means you have a broken neck. But the referees and Taz and the commentators and Vince McMahon were like, yeah, he can go have a fight. I don't see the problem. And even when this thing comes off because he is moving, <laughs> you don't even get a peep. I mean, JR kind of goes, oh no, this is going to be really bad. But then someone does a slam he's like, my God. When it comes to Jerry the King Lawler, he probably wouldn't have noticed anyway, because he's too busy talking about Stacey Keebler's assets. I flub and hate it. Mike 2 takes this horrendous beating and the flapjack he gets given, honestly. He gets thrown up to the sky when he finally gets the hot tag to Taz. 
and I'm amazed that he's able to move too, because before this, he'd been back suplexed on the floor. But again, they only go five minutes. How'd they fit it in? It just means he does have a good reason to get some revenge when Stacy gets up on the apron. I don't really know how else to tell you this, but the idea is, is she's kind of wiggling her ass. That's meant to distract Taz. I mean, you'd be a pretty bad wrestler, wouldn't you? Oh, I'm trying to defend this gold that I won with my partner, but there's the female of the species. I better go that way. It gets even more absurd too, because Taz's answer to this is to choke her. I mean, he puts her in the Taz mission, which again, somehow in the wrestling rule book is fine, but it's not. He is strangling her. This is awkward stuff. We then get more shenanigans because Demon goes to save her, but she gets knocked on the floor. Oh no, how did this possibly happen? When Spike goes to do the Dudley Dog, Devon grabs him and just hurls him onto the floor. I was like, well, now you've probably got a broken ass too. Thankfully, Taz has been watching this from afar and he sneaks in and locks on the Taz mission. Devon Dudley does pass out, meaning they are still the tag team champions. Very sadly, in 2002, WWE didn't really care about those belts. Hence why Taz and Spike Dudley were the damn champs. But look, it's fun enough. Up. When we get to go double this length in our next match. What a treat. This is super interesting in 2023 though, because it is Edge, who is the Intercontinental Champion, defending his belt against none other than William Regal. Now WWE already knew that Edge had a bright future, hence why he was the champ here. Problem is, William had those brass knucks. That's right, it's this version of Regal. It's great. Because he had thumped RVD and Edge on Raw with these damn things to set this match up. And when we got to SmackDown, Edge was so pissed off, he absolutely ruined William Regal with a chair. And then when referee Nick Patrick got involved, he smacked him too. I was like, oh, man, well, I hope that doesn't tie in here. And actually, it tied into the whole show. Edge also cuts a promo before this and just looks like a completely different person. And he still has his brood teeth in because he wasn't that far removed from that group. What a strange sentence to say. He should also probably be in jail because he actually brings out the chair that he dented William Regal's heads with. He was like, oh, man, I'm so proud of myself. Imagine you do that today. Find, find some kind of an object, can't even talk, smack someone in the skull, and then walk up to a random stranger and go, do you know what this is? It's a would-be murder weapon. Your ass got a prison. It does lead to another moment that we have always talked about, though, because before this match, Nick Patrick does check William Regal. He finds the Nux. Regal freaks out, but actually, he's got two pairs. And later on, after Edge has dived at him on the top rope and the referee has accidentally been knocked out, Regal puts his hands in his pants for about three seconds. You're like, well, this is uncomfortable. But then he shows you what he is doing. So what? You're like, oh, man, thank goodness for that. And two, it just reminds you once again, he's the best. It's really funny as well because JR and the King are like, we don't know what's going on. Why has Edge fallen on the floor after he gets smacked with these? I'm like, are you two kidding me? Stevie Wonder could have seen it. Thankfully, the referee comes to exactly the right moment, meaning Regal gets the pin and becomes the Intercontinental Champion. Look, I know I'm repeating myself here, but there's just something so damn good about 2002 Regal. I think he surveyed the way and he was like, I need to do something different. And he came up with this. So flipping entertaining. Up. And it's time for the Women's Championship next. I mean, you already know. I mean, it is kind of hilarious because Jacqueline, or Miss Jackie, is a special guest referee, and Jazz is the challenger, but they come out to exactly the same music. Because this was a time when if WWE didn't have a theme for you, they just go, you want some generic rock? Dun -dun, dun -dun -dun -dun. That's what people would come out to. I mean, it happened to Bradshaw for ages. I mean, there's every chance ever since he got put on the WWE network, it got dubbed over. But I still chuckled. You can already figure this out. It goes three minutes. Trish Stratus hits the Stratus faction and she gets the one, two, three. Now look, this was the rise of Trish as a very good women's wrestler. But if you want to see the definition of management not caring about something, exhibit A. Now I do actually think they did a decent job here. So I am going to give it an up because effort is important. But yeah, everything around it. And three minutes, I mean, you think that tag team was going to come out. Down. You then see Ric Flair arrive at the arena with his family. And man, he is with his daughter Megan, but he's also with his son Reed. If you don't know, Reed would die a few years after this of a drug overdose. That was just horrible to watch. Apparently, though, he is going to take Vince McMahon to school because our next match is the Nature Boy. 
taking on the chairman of a board in a street fight. Now, of course, this tied into the whole fallout from the invasion angle because Flair had bought stocks and shares or whatever from Shane and Stephanie McMahon. So he was now in business with Vince and because they couldn't get on in the offices, they decided to kick the crap out of each other instead. Now, as we've already talked about, this would lead to the arrival of the NWO. And in March, we got the first ever brand split. Oodle The man also arrives here looking the size of a house. He is so big, but this actually ties into the early going, because even though he is taking on Rick Flippin' Flair, he outpowers him and throws him around for a good six minutes. I couldn't believe it. He also hits Flair with a keep off sign. I'm like, well, that's ironic when he gets a trash can and just slams it in his head. Well, they go back into the ring and Vince McMahon is trying to apply the figure four. Now, of course, everyone is like, no, you can't do that to Flair. It's his move. I was like, I don't care about the maneuver. Why the hell did you start using weapons and then go back to move? Rick is also bleeding, so who had around about six minutes, although one of the best bits is because Ric Flair's family's at ringside with a camera, Vince McMahon steals it, starts taking pictures. It's actually quite funny. The escalation is then off the charts because all of a sudden Vince realized, oh yeah, I should try and kill you with this massive pipe. When Flair has a plan, he was like, oh man, I forgot. Vince McMahon has a penis and he smacks him right in it. It also serves as the getting off point for this because all of a sudden Vince McMahon is going into the ring post, going to sim with the steel steps. He's going into Alan the announce table. <laughs> Rick Flair just absolutely wails on him. I'm like, well, why weren't you doing this four minutes ago? He also then gets Megan to take some more picks because Vince McMahon is bleeding. That one's just a little bit more screwed up. When they go back in the ring, he applies the figure four and McMahon taps out. But look, one, this is pretty fun. And two, it just goes to show. There's a lot of things we can say about Vince and we should. But in terms of understanding the role as a heel and selling his ass off, that is pretty good. It was shorter than I expected, but then I was like, wait a minute, it's a 53-year-old man. Taking on a 57-year-old man, it went long enough. And again, I was sports entertained, but I'm a bad person. Up. We then make sure to get it across that Nick Patrick, the referee, knows something fishy is going on. Because Michael Cole is here, who clearly has only just been born. And he says, well, did you see what William Regal did earlier? What are you going to do about it? Patrick's way to sell this is to stroke his non-existent beard and nod as if he's in some kind of high school play. When Stephanie McMahon comes up, says, look, you go over there or something. And she's all like, man, I'm so happy my dad got his ass whipped. And also later, my husband, Triple H, will win the Raw Rumble. Like, that's not how you answer that question at all. She also wants to kill Deborah, which is the ultimate setup, because when she is running her down, who appears behind her? Stone Cold Steve Austin. This is when he's going full on watting as well, to the point he wats her away. That's the only way to talk about it. And then he wats in Michael Cole's face. And I honestly think he drops that word about 42 times. So no wonder we're still charting it now. You do have to love him though, because there's just something special about Steve. And of course, he is going to win the Raw Rumble. He didn't. When we get The Rock versus Chris Jericho, the WWE title. I totally forgot about it. No, it is foolproof because we are in 2002 and it's The Rock and Chris Jericho. And this is tied into the last pay-per-view where Chris Jericho hoped to fit a stone cold Steve Austin and The Rock in the same evening. Now, we couldn't get back to Steve Austin at this juncture, but you know the deal with Rocky. He would lose to anybody. He didn't care. But somebody went, well, just have Jericho face him. I mean, you can tell instantly that he is going to lose because he kicks out of two lion salts. Got to make him look strong here, pal. But honestly, if you are looking for some evidence or an example of how to protect your most over baby face, this is what you do. Because the people's champ has this one after he locks in the sharpshooter. Although seriously, you could fit a cat through those holes. So I don't know why you want to. And even though Jericho is tapping out like a madman, the referee doesn't see because out comes Test and out comes Lance Storm. And because they're all Canadians, they want to help Chris. Now this is when Nick Patrick is back because I told you the Royal Rumble is completely built around him. And he's like, listen, you north of the border fools. You're not allowed out here. And he sends them to the back. Jericho's big plan is then to rock bottom the rock through Alan the announce table. But of course, it's Jericho that suffers the rock bottom. Because as we've already talked about, don't steal people's moves. We then bump El Hebner, who is the actual referee, because the flames of the actual era are still alive. Where somehow Jericho just goes, Alakabam. And he's got the world title in his hands. How did he do that? And he levels the rock right in the face. He does get a really good one, two, ooh, because the rock kicks out at the last second. When he hits the DDT, he covers Christopher, and Nick goes, I'm really sorry, can't, can't do that pin, even though I have come here to be the referee. 
It's like, man, you are just a bad, bad person. He, of course, gets rock bottom because Flub, that guy, as Jericho takes the people's elbow. Once again, you know the deal. There was no one around to count the one, two, three. This is when Chris Jericho took a page out of Ric Flair's books. He's like, oh my gosh, The Rock has a penis. And he punches him in it. By this point, too, Tina the Turnbuckle had been exposed, so Jericho throws The Rock's head into that, where he basically does the most devastating move in all of sports entertainment, the surprise roll-up, and he puts his feet on the ropes. This is when Earl Hebner is back all groggy. And even though anyone in their right mind would be able to see this, for some reason he can't. One, two, three. And Chris Jericho is essentially stolen the match and he retained the title. Now, I do want to say this is actually really fun and very indicative of what was going down at the time. It's also flapping ridiculous. Like Jericho could have got a gun and shot him and it wouldn't have been as silly as this, but I am giving it up. When we get to the Raw Rumble, 69 minutes and 22 seconds. My word. And when we do do Raw Rumbles on retro ups and downs, people always go, fine, and I just wanted a list of entrants in the right order. Well, fine, you've got to get it. And it goes, Rikishi, Gold Dust, the Big Boss Man, and what tweet that is, Bradshaw, Lance Storm, Al Snow, my wrestling trainer, Billy Gunn, The Undertaker, Matt Hardy, Jeff Hardy, so there's definitely some cheat in there, Maven, Scotty Duhai, Christian, DDP, Chuck Palumbo, The Godfather, Albert, Perry Saturn, Don Carl, Steve Austin, Val Venus, Tess, Triple H, The Hurricane, Farouk, Mr. Perfect, Kurt Angle, The Big Show, Kane, RVD, and Booker T. Who? Booker T. So really, other than Mr. Perfect, there's not that many surprises is, although he's not really a surprise anyway. But WWE absolutely gets away with this because go back through some of these names, it is rammed with stars. I suppose the only real major talking point, given that we do still discuss it in 2023, is everything we did with Maven. Because my word. Now he'd won tough enough and was finding his way and we were all in his corner because it felt like one of us had made it to the big time. When somebody had the idea, well look, The Undertaker's going to be kind of doing a mini feud with the Hardys. When his back is turned, why doesn't Maven do that drop kick he likes to do? He can slam Taker in the back and he can fall to the floor. And that did happen. People went crazy because flopped me sideways. Maven, the tough enough rookie, had just eliminated the Undertaker. Now people like to pretend this was a platform to send Maven off into the stratosphere. But it ain't, right? I'm correcting it right now because after this, Somebody call the cops. I saw a murder. Now, it's hard to watch this in 2023, but the dead man gets a chair and he waffles Maven so hard, I'm amazed he still has a brain, that he gets back in the ring and he just throws him over the top rope. And because the Royal Rumble has silly rules, everyone's like, yep, that's an elimination. But don't get me wrong, never change it. It makes me happy. He then drags Maven's lifeless corpse up to the concession area, hurls him through a popcorn maker when the Undertaker is stood there going, mm, Man, what a delicious treat as blood pours from Maven's head. I'm like, this is disgusting. So here is the deal. Even though it has become the stuff of legend today, I think this is a complete utter burial. So I'm giving it a down. On the flip side, it is a moment. And when you hear Maven talk about it, it makes him so damn happy. That makes me happy. Also, what do I know? Just so nerd on the internet. Up. If you do have dreams of being a wrestler yourself too, just make sure you tell every promoter well, I would like to be Stone Cold Steve Austin. Because when he gets in here, he throws out Test, Perry Saturn, Val Venus and Christian in honestly about 25 seconds. Then he's just walking around the ring going, oh yeah, who's next? Now it does leave the question of well, who the hell's going to eliminate him. But man, the next person out is Triple H. And of course, before Triple H did tear his quad, Austin and the game with a two-man power trip. Well, I assume the rattlesnake didn't send any flowers because they get into it right away. We also held the Hurricane out, who's the next guy to come down the ramp, and that is so good, because we've played off this in recent years. Hurricane decides, well, I'm going to choke slam you, Triple H, and I'm going to choke slam you, Austin. They look at him, they laugh, and they throw him over the top. Shane Helms rules. That gets it up. We then do double back round as to who should be the guy to suck him to the floor. Because in 2002, even though he was already a star, somebody had decided, oh, wait, this Kurt Angle is absolutely brilliant. We should do something with him. So after he has German suplex everyone, and again, this was 21 years ago, he sees that Stone Cold is trying to eliminate Mr. Perfect. He looks to the right, he looks to the left, he runs in, and he throws Austin to the floor. And just listen to these fans, they cannot believe it. It also ends with Angle going at it with Triple H. Once again, we are building him up. And of course, it tied into what they had done after Triple H's return, because those two had interacted 
<laughs> when Kurt is leaning against the ropes, Triple H runs at him and just kills him with this clothesline. I don't know how his head stayed off. The fans do react massive to this, though, and once again, it had to be Triple H because he was over like Rover. I actually thought this was a very fun Raw Rumble, especially because the winner was obvious. Usually that makes it suffer, but they did enough here to keep you interested because essentially it went massive star story. There you go. Massive star story. There you go. And so on and so forth. You could learn a thing or two from this. Up. And before I leave you, I shall give you a second opinion because I do have Dave Meltzer's star ratings. He gave the opening tag one and a half stars. Regal versus Edge got two and a quarter. Seems harsh. Tristan Jazz got one and a half. Flair versus McMahon got two and three quarter stars. Chris Jericho versus The Rock got four and a quarter stars. And the Royal Rumble got three and a half stars. That seems fair. Overall, too, I am going to give the 2002 Royal Rumble an up as well, because again, it's very synonymous of its time. But by the end of it, you just feel like you had a good time on a roller coaster. What? I don't know. Now, of course, please make sure you do leave a comment below and let me know what other shows we should be doing for Retro Ups and Downs and what you thought about the 2002 Royal Rumble. I look on the screen right now. It's the Retro Ups and Downs. Continue on your past journeys. And it's a salute from me and a big old thumb. Thank you for stopping by. We'll be back with Retro Ups and Downs in a couple of weeks. That's right. It's two a month. People don't seem to be grasping this. But I love you anyway. See you then.